We're going to be looking at Psalm 112 this morning. So go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 112. And if you are able and willing, would you please stand with me as we, we read the Word of God together? Okay, Psalm 112 reads, Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They've freely scattered their gifts to the poor, and their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning to us. Uh, You are good, uh, and your love endures forever, God. Um, Bless us, Lord, as we study your word. Uh, Open our eyes and our our ears and our hearts, Lord, to the things you have for us this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this psalm is Psalm... 111, 112, and 113 are hallelujah psalms. And so it starts out with praise the Lord. The word there is hallelujah. So whenever I hear the word hallelujah, it reminds me of, uh, you know, the hallelujah chorus and Handel's Messiah. And um, it takes me back to when I was in school and college. We used to have chapel services throughout the week. I went to a Christian college. And so we would go to chapel service. It was at 10 o'clock every, every morning, Monday through Friday. And so I always sat in the same place. You guys probably are sitting right now in the same place you sit in every time. And I was a little bit late this morning, and so, or that morning, and so I, uh, I was rushing over there, and um, they didn't have any more handouts left. And, uh, and so I slipped in the back and looked at my normal, where my normal spot was and, and saw some of my friends, uh, Andrea and Erica, and, and I waved at them and they waved at me, and I came and sat down next to them, and, they looked at me a little bit funny, and I looked at them and was like, what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> and then um, as I looked up and saw that there was special instrumentation, and they had cameras out and everything, and it was going to be a special musical morning, and they started, you know, doing the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah. So, um, and I realized that different sections were singing at different times, and I was like, oh, this was interesting. And I looked around, and Andrea and Erica were here. And I was in a section full of women. I was in the soprano section that morning. <laughs> so I had to sing in falsetto. So. so when I hear hallelujah, sometimes it brings me back to that moment. And uh, they were recording it because it was going out to all the families and everybody that was at the college for Christmas that year. So hallelujah. <laughs> Um, Psalm 112 here. Uh, the Psalms are the, the hymn book of the temple, the Old Testament temple, the Jewish people. The word psalm in Greek means song or that, the words that accompany music. So all of these were put to, to music here. And the Psalms, if you've ever re- read through them, they, they run the gamut of the human emotion. There's highs, there's lows, there's joys, the frustrations, um, even uh, the imprecatory Psalms when uh, David and, and the other psalm writers are crying out for justice that the wicked would be destroyed. We, we find ourselves in those same situations sometimes. Uh, but in just as the heart is the center of man, so the psalms are at the center of the Bible. Like literally, the center of the Bible is the book of Psalms, and Psalm 119 is the exact center of the Bible. And Psalm 119 exalts God's word. It's a blessed book to turn to in times of trouble, um, if you find yourself in the hospital or you go to visit friends, uh, the Psalms are a, a wonderful place for comfort. But also in times of happiness or thanksgiving, Psalms are a wonderful place to turn to. Usually if I ask my son, uh, Elliot, what he wants to read, if he wants to read the Bible, he always says Psalm 49. I don't know. I don't get it. 
but that's just what he says. Uh, the Psalms, there's multiple authors that went into writing the Psalms. David wrote 73 Psalms. Moses wrote one, Solomon two. The sons of Korah, 11. Asaph, 12. Heman, one. Ethan, one. Hezekiah, 10. And then 39 Psalms, including this Psalm here, 111, are orphanic Psalms or orphan Psalms that we don't know who the author is. So this Psalm 112 this morning would fall into that. This psalm is an acrostic, which means every uh, line begins with a, a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Psalms 111 and 112 are actually both acrostics, and they're hallelujah psalms. Actually, Psalm 111 and 112 are related. They both have 22 lines. They're both acrostics. They both begin with hallelujah. They have similar structures. They use similar phrases. The difference being that Psalm 111 focuses on God and his glory and his attributes in Psalm 112, what we're in today, focuses on God's people and the glory that God's ascribed to them and their attributes. Charles Spurgeon once said the following about Psalm 112, it, it bears the same relation to the preceding psalm which the moon does to the sun. For while the first declares the glory of God, the second speaks of the reflection of the divine brightness in me born from above. So. Uh, God is the one who gives glory to his people, uh, and just like the, salt, the sun gives light to the moon, and the moon just reflects that light. But it begins with this opening statement, hallelujah. Uh, our translation, your translation would say, praise the Lord, um, but this here says, hallelujah. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Someone once said, he who fears the Lord has nothing else to fear. And when I say fear the Lord, we don't mean, you know, a cowering in, in the corner kind of fear. Though, when we look at the apostles or people throughout the scripture, we see when they were approached with the angel of the Lord sometimes, or, or just an angel showed up, they fell on their face in fear at the awesome display of God or even of his angels. But remember, in Revelation, when John, who is a dear, beloved friend of Jesus and his disciple, saw Jesus, as he is, he fell on his face as though dead in fear. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and said, fear not, fear not. So the fear of the Lord is a healthy respect and a reverence, understanding that God is the creator and we are his creation. He's the potter and we are the clay. Think of Job. Job, a righteous man, a wonderful man, a man without uh, any real fault or blame on his part. Uh, sought an audience with God when things were going wrong in his life because he wanted to speak with God to win his case before God. If only I could speak with God and explain to him how these bad things that are happening to me shouldn't be happening to me. And when God eventually showed up and had a conversation with him, Job repented in dust and ashes, remembering that he is just a man and that God is God. That God doesn't answer to us, we answer to him. This is, the, this is the type of the fear of the Lord that we're discussing here. But this says, blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Now the world looks at us and they don't think necessarily that we're blessed. They think something more like pathetic is the man who fears the Lord. How many of you have been asked, so what are you up to this weekend? And you say something, perhaps along the lines of, yeah, I'm just gonna hang out with my family and go to church on Sunday. And then you just get that blank stare. Have you ever gotten that? Like, what, who are you and what universe or planet are you from, right? Um, why aren't, or I used to work construction, so sometimes when people asked me that and I told them what I was doing, they would just stare at me like, so you're not partying like the rest of us? Well, no, I'm not. Because 1 Peter 4, 3 through 5 says, for if you spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry, they're surprised that you don't join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you, but they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So I want to live my life, you know, ready to be judged by God. And everybody ought to have that same sort of fear and understanding. Um, maybe the other people in this world think we're pathetic, but really, truly, uh, we are blessed by God. We are blessed by God. And that and this passage here goes through the different ways in which God blesses his righteous, holy people. And we're gonna look into that. 
So blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. So there's different ways that we can respond to God's demands, or demands and commands. Um, the first thing that we can do is we can be dismissive of his commands instead of delighting in them. Um, you know, I think of a lot of juvenile uh, responses, but the dismissive one says, you know, you're not the boss of me, God. You're not the boss of me, you don't tell me what to do with my life, and so we just discard his commands. But we can also, when he commands us something, um, I think of my son, Elliot. Um, I'll, sometimes I'll say, Elliot, you need to come here and pick up your toys, and the next thing I know, he's gone, right? He pulled a Jonah, okay? So you can have a Jonah response, just like the catch me if you can sort of thing. You know what God says, and you're like, I'm gonna outrun him, which is, I mean, you're, it's God here, right? So we saw what happened to Jonah. Um, when God commands us something, we can whine. We can throw, you know, I, I'm just, I'm, again, I'm thinking of my toddler here, but we can throw a Christian temper tantrum. Why do I have to do this? Why don't I ever get what I wanna do? We can become embittered or angry. We can, um, we can be minimalistic, you know, sure, I guess, you know, God is God, and I'll just do what I have to do, but I'm just going to do the bare minimum. Um, and then we can try to be accruing brownie points with God as well. You know, I'll do this, but God's, you know, I'm going to have to cash in my check or my, my chips soon enough, and God will owe me one down the road. And then we can delight in him, which is where we, we love God and we love to do his will. So we, have di- we can have different responses, but he said, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. And I don't know about you guys, but I have found just through the years, when I say no to God, I'm miserable. And when I say yes to God, it might be a little bit scary because you're not, you're not sure what's going to happen. But God always comes through. He always is right there. And I never lack. As Americans, we love our freedom. You know, we, we don't want people to tell us what to do. We're free people. We're an independent people. And yet, God asks us to willingly submit ourselves to him as king. And we do that because we found that our own lives, without a king, God is king, was like in the lives of the times of the judges, where it says everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in the land, and everything was falling apart left and right. And so we put our trust in God, and we found that he's actually faithful. And day by day, we've trusted in God, and we found that he's able to take care of us, he take care of our needs. The Lord honors his faithful servant. And I was just thinking about this the other day, that I'm his servant. I mean, the Lord even says that uh, a good man, a righteous man, takes in the Proverbs, a, a righteous man takes care of the needs of his animals. And Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount how, you know, he takes care of the animals. How much more will he take care of us? You know, if I'm a servant of God, Will he not take care of my needs? I think he will, and I have found that he does. So, God takes care of us, and I, and I want to be a man who finds more and more great delight in his commands. And then he goes on and talks about the benefits of godliness. And I want to give kind of a benefit disclaimer, because sometimes when we read the Psalms or the Proverbs, you know, and it says something like, the children will be mighty in the land, and we think to ourselves, well, you know, I don't have any kids, or... What about my kids didn't turn out that way? Well, I mean, there's Deuteronomy, God told the Israelites that the benefits would come from obedience and that their curses would come from disobedience. And we're focusing on these benefits, but these benefits are generally true. It's like the Proverbs, given the right conditions and barring a tragedy, this is what will typically happen. If you, if you discipline your kids and you show them the right way to go, they will typically go the right way. Barring a tragedy, right? But he says here that their children will be mighty in the land. And sometimes we think, you know, big, strong, muscular, mighty, but it's more like strong in the Lord. Um, when I hear mighty in the land, I think of uh, who are strong, strong men in the past, and comes to mind Nimrod the Great, that mighty hunter before the Lord. If you remember back in Genesis, he was the first strong man. Um, and uh, Josephus, Flavius Josephus, actually gives us a little bit of insight into him. So it was after the flood, about the time of the building of the Tower of Babel, it says, now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God 
as if it was through his means that they were happy, but to leave that it was their own courage that, which procured their happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a con constant dependence upon his power. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again. For that, he would build a tower too high for the waves to be able to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. So you see, this was a first strong man, and his, in his strength, he decided to credit himself and his people for the goodness that, you know, the blessing of, of their land, and actually to challenge God. That was the idea of the Tower of Babel, to build it so high that, you know, the waves couldn't reach the top. And, and then it was interesting, too, that he gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no, way of, no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them in a, into a constant dependence upon his power. Well, we see that governments are still doing that today. <laughs> Things after the flood haven't really changed so much. So much. But we're not talking about a strong man like him. We're, we're talking about a strength in the Lord, the offspring of God. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? He seeks godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. Malachi 2.15. So God's desire is to seek, is for us to have godly offspring. And I step back for a minute and I think, uh, you know, God made the angels, he made the heavens, he made the earth, and the angels, as according to Jesus, they don't reproduce. Their number is fixed. So he made, and then he made the world and he put man here. And man is able to reproduce. And man was tasked to fill the earth with offspring, to work the land, subdue it, like in the Garden of Eden. So the earth was, earth was to be full of people, more and more. And it's so similar in even Jesus' command to go therefore, therefore into all the world and make disciples. It's a continuation of that same thought, that fulfillment of God's plan to fill the earth with godly offspring. God's original purpose. Though with Christ it's an offspring born of the Spirit of God. So, I mean, I have sought to use my life uh, in a way in which people would come to know God. And so um, I've spent a lot of time studying the Word, and I teach youth, and I've been teaching uh, for years and years. I've made it in my endeavor to teach people the Word of God so that they might live godly lives, especially the young people. But there's always, I always find a distance because, you know, they have their own parents and, and then they go home to their parents, and that's the way God made it, and that's okay. But my wife and I, we have a family. We've got boys, and we get to teach those boys every day whether, we, whether to follow God or not to follow God. And it's not easy because, as, is, as has been said, more is, seems to be caught than taught. So we, we strive to live honest, godly lives and teach our kids uh, to love the Lord. So... You know, for instance, we do a few things. We, we pray with them at night. We pray before meals with them. Uh, we have little, you know, storybook Bibles for the kids at their age that they can read. So, not like the King James. So, you know, something a little bit more their level. But, you know, for instance, when we pray together before meals, um, we, we thank God for the different things that he does for us. And um, after we say amen, our youngest son, Lincoln, he doesn't say anything really, words yet, but uh, his grandma taught him to raise his hands. It means praise the Lord. So, <laughs> praise the Lord. And then, um, but before that, usually when I pray, I ask my oldest boy, Elliot, if he wants to thank God for something, and usually he thanks God for his toys and his games. And if we told him we're having dessert, he thanks God in advance for ice cream. Sometimes it's really heartwarming. He'll thank God for family and friends, you know. So right now we're, we're actually expecting to have another boy in September. And he was like, we asked him one time, what do you thank God for? And he's like, I thank God for William. William isn't born yet. We're like, oh, that's so cute. The other day I asked him um, if he wanted to thank God for something. And he pointed over my shoulder. And I looked. And the, we have a pantry there, and it was closed. And on the top of our pantry is this white lock you know, a child lock. And I was like, is that, you thank God for that? He's like, yeah. And I look over at Lincoln and he raises his hands. So, 
Sometimes we try to teach them, and sometimes it's a prayer circus. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so I have that every day I get to try, try to teach my kids how to follow the Lord. And God's tasked us with that, and that's his desire. Godly offspring is his desire. And so some of us think, you know, what if my kids have strayed? You know, some of us have uh, prodigal sons or prodigal daughters, and we think to ourselves, you know, I've tried my best, but, but they've strayed, and we feel like failures. But keep in mind, it happened to God, right? His first son, Adam, strayed. His first daughter, Eve, strayed. The story of the prodigal son, the idea is there's a, it's a holy, righteous, good father in his son strayed, right? So it's not always your fault. And, and we gotta pray to God, and, and if we did something, we ask for forgiveness, but we, we just gotta keep praying for those pig pen moments where the, the prodigal son was in the pig pen because he you know, spent all his riches and wild living and had nothing, and he longed to eat the, the pods that the pigs ate, and then it, it came to him. It, suddenly it came to him, like the lights were on, like he was living in darkness and the lights came on. And he said, it's so much better in my dad's house. I just need to go back there. Our kids need to have, some of our kids need to have those, mo those moments. And so until then, we pray for them and we endeavor to live godly lives, continuing to set that example of God's gracious, loving kindness. And some of us think, I don't have any kids. Some of us don't have any kids. So, you know, the idea of the godly offspring, you know, could be uh, kind of hit a place in our heart that uh, brings up some pain. So whether you've remained single or you've never been able to have kids or you, maybe you've lost some family members, Galatians 4.27 says a powerful thing here. It says, be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud you who are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who was a husband. And you're like, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, here's what, what I mean by that. In, uh, I was meeting the other day or a couple months ago with a man uh, who worked with Compassion International. So it does a, a work similar to Gospel for Asia where they take care of orphaned uh, children in impoverished uh, countries around the world. And him and his wife, uh, have been working together in this ministry um, for years, and they're barren. They're not able to have children. But their job is to take care of orphans, and they've devoted their entire lives to that. And we were just talking, I was like, that's crazy what you guys are doing, because it's a fulfillment of this passage. And he says, what passage? <laughs> so he had never read this or heard this before, and it was really, for him, it was kind of encouraging, because they want to have kids. Um, but until then, they're taking care of kids that, they, that, are the, that aren't taken care of by their own parents. So, um, and I've seen this. I've seen other people just give themselves to this work. Um, so if you are unable to have kids or are single, I would you know, pray that you might consider that opportunity. But he, says, he goes on and says, Wealth and riches are in their house. The righteousness endures forever. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely. They've freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Now, God never promises that becoming a Christian is a get-rich-quick scheme. Being a Christian is not about that. The Apostle Paul even goes on and says, people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and think that godliness is a means to financial gain, rather, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy 6, 5 through 10. Jesus once spoke uh, with a self-righteous, wealthy man. He came to Jesus, said, what must I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus told him to follow the commands, and he said, I've you know, followed the commands since I was a youth. And then Jesus said, do this, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven. And the man went away sad. And Jesus, that's when Jesus said, it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. 
And his disciples thought, well, if you're rich, that means God's blessed you. So they said, uh, who then can be saved? <laughs> Aren't these the people who are blessed? And Jesus said, what's impossible with man is possible with God. And then Peter said, we've left everything to follow you. And then Jesus says this incredible thing here. He goes, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last in the last first. So when I was younger, I thought owning nothing, you know, being single, following Jesus, impoverished, like Paul on the road, beaten, uh, everywhere I turned for the sake of the gospel was the most godly way to live, and I strived for it. And because God didn't call me to that, I was discouraged with myself. And it was Jesus' own words in this passage that rebuked me. If you've left stuff for Jesus, he'll provide things in this life, along with persecutions, and in the life to come. It, it hit me. It hit me. That's interesting. He said, no one who's left all these things will not fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, along with persecutions, and in the life to come, eternal life. I was, I, it hit me, because I'd never thought of it before. I'd only thought of the eternal life aspect. But then I realized, you know, if you've left stuff to follow Jesus, you're, you're going to be worried that you won't end up with anything. But God will take care of you. He might even bestow upon you all the things that your heart desires. And that's God's blessing, and that's okay. So I work a lot for the Lord. I mean, I work a lot of overtime. I make it my endeavor to pay our debts and our, our bills and obligations at my home. Um, and then I look around my home, I start taking inventory, and I realize, you know, that was a gift, that was a gift, that was a gift. Our basement's full of toys, and I bought like two of them, <laughs> you know. Um, and sometimes I get embarrassed because I focus on the work of God and trying to live within the means which he's given me, but he's provided way above and beyond anything that I could have strived for. And it's not something that I demanded of him, and it's not something that I ought to grasp onto, but I accept God's gifts with gratitude and an open hand. There was one time um, uh, when I was right out of college, I didn't really have any money, and I had a bunch of friends who were getting together in Canada, and I wanted to go visit them, and um, I had uh, somebody who wanted to give me a little bit of money for gas so that I can go over and travel, and I didn't want to accept it. I didn't want to accept the money. I didn't want to accept charity. I don't want to be a charity case, you know. And the person was really upset, and I went and prayed about it. And I felt the Lord say, if you are unable to accept charity, then how can you accept my salvation? Which is a free gift of God. If you can't accept a gift from other people, how can you accept a gift from God? I thought, okay. <laughs> and so now, you know, I want to be generous to other people and be able to lend and give. And so if I'm in a time of need, then I need to be able to accept that as well from other people. I realized that it was just my pride. It was just my pride that was in the way. In Philippians 4, Paul described learning the secret of being content in any situation, any circumstance. He said, whether well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. And often we focus on being content when we are hungry or in want, and we need to. And we need to learn how to be content in that. But Paul had to learn how to be content when he was well-fed and in plenty as well. Content not to demand more, content to give, and content not to condemn yourself if God has truly blessed you and has been gracious to you, but to instead humbly and gratefully receive that from God. If God's blessed you overflowing, then you don't need to beat yourself up about it. Your prayer ought to be, Lord, what would you have me do with this blessing? If you've given it to me, what would you have me do with it? Everything I have is yours, not just 10%. Everything I have is yours, so Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Where do you want me to live? Uh, what do you want me to buy? How do you want me to handle this? Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, 
for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you'll abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 9. So God's called us to be generous. If God has blessed you over abundantly, he's called you to be generous with that as a steward of his resources. He's given it to you so you might you know, pray and seek God's face and be like, Father, if you're a generous giver and you've given this to me, what ought I to do in return? Then it goes on and says, even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. I just love the wording of this. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. It reminds us of, uh, you know, when the sun sets at night, inevitably it will rise in the morning. Now, some people have a different, you know, they have a more glass half full idea. So every time it rises, it's going to set again. I went to uh, Australia once on a biking tour when I was younger, like Lance Armstrong, except we weren't very good. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they had a lot of hills, and the hills were a struggle for us. And so the, the guy who was leading the group, um, or there was a younger guy in our group, and he said, oh, I hate these hills. And, and the guy who was leading the group is, just think of, for, you know, every time you're going uphill, there's going to be a downhill. And the guy goes, no, every time there's downhill, there's another uphill. <laughs> so. But that not ought to be our perspective. Just as the sun inevitably rises after night, so the light of Christ will be evident in a believer's life when circumstances beg to differ. We live in a dark, dark world. We live in a world where people are doing evil, wicked things, and we see it. We see it on the news, we see it in our own lives, we see it in our families, we see it in our own hearts. We, when people start fighting uh, and evil starts coming upon us, our initial fleshly reaction is to fight back, to fight fire with fire. It's to get them before they get you, or they would have done the same thing to me, but you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Don't hide your light. Let it shine. You aren't to live like everybody else. The world doesn't need more of the world. The world needs Jesus. And you're the light. You're the, you're the plan. You're the plan. Jesus wants to use you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Proverbs 3, 6. And we submit to him, uh, not just in our thoughts, but it says, in all your ways, submit to him. So in our actions, our attitudes, uh, and the way we live our life. He says to be gracious, where we look to build up people, not to tear them down. He tells us to be compassionate, so when we look at those who are suffering or in hardships, that we actually help them. We don't just think about helping them, but, but we help them as far as we're able to. That we're righteous, which means we live to... We strive to live a right life before God and before men. We conduct our affairs with justice, where we take care of other people and we take care of our obligations. We don't take advantage of people, and we don't take advantage of their, uh, maybe if they don't see something. All we can do is try to be faithful to Christ, and we trust in him to come through, even if we can't understand how we'll fix the problem. We're blind in the darkness, but to God, even the night is as light, the psalmist says. God sees everything clearly. You know, to us, we see, you know, like a, like a light to our path that's dimly in front of us or through a glass dimly, but, but God sees everything clearly, and he'll guide us. So even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. And then it goes on, says, the righteous will never be shaken. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. Bad news, we're constantly being fed bad news. How many of you guys, um, I mean, I do it too, so I, I, I you know, listen to different uh, podcasts, uh, uh, news podcasts, and I, I read the news online, and it's always bad news. It's always bad news. And I find myself, I want to read the bad news. It's sensational. It, it sparks in me a kind of uh, righteous indignation um, that I think is so, uh, which is so appetizing. Um, it's, it's bad news that sells, but it's bad news that often like, launches us into those like, fears and anxieties of the way the world's going and the things that are coming. 
But the word here says that we'll have no fear of bad news. Our hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Not trusting in our own schemes or not hedging ourselves against the economy necessarily or not hedging ourselves against the, the evils of this world, but our trust is in the Lord. Our hearts are steadfast and secure in him. The Lord tells us, I mean, I was reading this morning in, in Revelation a little bit, and Jesus is encouraging the people to follow him in these different churches. And he said to one church, he said, those who overcome, who, those who are victorious, uh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and they'll never be shaken. Steadfast in the Lord. He's our rock. We're steadfast in him. Bad news comes, but we ought not to feed ourselves bad news. And then he, he talks about how they will be remembered forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. We will have an exalted name. The horn here they're talking about is like the shofar. Um, so I've got a picture. There's uh, two different kinds that are typical. There's the ram's horn, which is short or curved. Uh, and then there's the, the um, Yemenite horn from Akudu, which is long and twisted. The horn is a declaration of strength, it's a declaration of victory, it's a, a declaration of a dominion and, and right to rule, like a crown. Animals who have these horns wear them prominently on their head, front and foremost, and they lift their chest high. Um, it's their chief means of defense and attack. You think of like a ram or a deer. They would use these horns uh, to carry anointing oil to anoint their kings and priests. They would blast through the horn, horn, that was their trumpet. When they talk about the trumpet blast, it was a shofar here um, uh, to signal the enemies or to signal victory. Um, and it's God himself who does the remembering. It's God himself who exalts. It's God himself who lifts up the horn. Uh, he's our victory, and he lifts us up, and he gives us a name forever. And I was in that reading in Revelation this morning, I also read that those who ever overcome will be given a new name, a name that God himself knows, and it will last forever. That's pretty cool. But it's God who exalts. It's God who um, brings low those who exalt themselves and those who humble themselves before God. He exalts. He lifts up. He strengthens. So this is the, the blessings that we have of those who, who follow the Lord. Uh, we'll have no fear of bad news. Uh, we will see our children become mighty in the, in the land uh, as they follow the Lord. Uh, God will bestow upon us wealth, is, wealth and, and riches, which we are to be generous with. Uh, God tells us that he's gonna pull through for us even when in the darkness. Um, he expects us to live lives just like he lives, uh, gracious, compassionate, righteous, and he, he assures us that we'll be remembered forever, that we will never be shaken. But he says something interesting at the end here. The wicked, in contrast to the righteous, will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. They will observe us, they will see these things, and they'll be vexed, they'll be troubled in their heart, and they'll gnash their teeth. Gnashing of teeth uh, means they're burning with anger, rage, hatred. This is the way that the wicked ought to look at us when they observe our lives. You know, some Christians, going back to the bad news, we're committed to following national news, and instead we're the ones who burn with anger or jealousy over the wicked. But it's not supposed to be that. It's supposed to be the other way around. That's not our place, to be angry or jealous of the wicked. And sometimes I think um, we have expectations that Jesus uh, doesn't say. We have expectations of the kingdom of God which are uh, not from the Lord. We have expectations uh, that you know, if we could just get enough Christians in position of power, then uh, we will be victorious and the land will flourish. And we're not promised that from God. It's actually a different kind of theology. It's called Kingdom Now Theology, well, the Latter Rain Movement, or Dominion Theology. It teaches something like, you know, the kingdom of God, you know, we believe that Jesus Christ will come back and reign for a thousand years. He'll set up his kingdom then. But they believe that the, you know, 
they're either all millennial, which means the kingdom is now, or that they're, they're post-millennial, thinking that we've got, to set up, uh, we've got to set up the kingdom and then Jesus will come back. So they, they teach something like this, that if we have Christians take over different areas of society, education, government, business, finance, medicine, science, only when we've sufficiently taken these domains for Christ will he return. And we're always on the brink of, or the, the brink of major breakthrough, but we never quite get there. And so sometimes we can think that, or we can feel that. Why can't we just have more righteous people? Then we'd be a righteous land. But Jesus says the wicked will continue to be wicked, the righteous will continue to be righteous, and it's God who places leaders in the role of government. And it looks like wick, wicked people are in leadership still all over the, wheel, the world, even though there's some that are righteous in position of leadership. And God has allowed both. So we're instead to pray for our leaders, the righteous and the unrighteous alike, and strive to live godly and peaceable lives with them. But the, the false kingdom now theologies can stir up an unhealthy anxiety when we see wicked people in positions of power. We think that maybe if we'd prayed enough, or we were holy enough, or we were unified enough, that Christians would be in that place. But the truth is, in the end, Jesus comes down from heaven as he went up, and he establishes his kingdom at his second coming. That's when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and Messiah, not before. So we can't put those um, unreal, unrealistic expectations on ourselves as Christians to take over the world. That's not our job. So we are not to, not to be anxious about these things, or jealous or in a rage over not having your people in power. When you see the wicked, don't burn inside. Instead, continue on in righteousness and in prayer. They are to be jealous over your godly conduct and the blessings of Christ in your life, hopefully leading them to repentance. And that's the goal. The kindness of God ought to lead us towards repentance. But instead, the wicked, they look at us, they're vexed, they gnash their teeth, they waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. The wicked desire applause, they desire pleasure, they desire uh, earthly possessions and mastery over other people, just like Nimrod. But in the end, everything is stripped away from them as they face eternity without God. That brief moment of time that they had to live for themselves in this life vanishes. Uh, that's the idea when Ecclesi the writer of Ecclesiastes says meaningless. It's like the word for a vanishing vapor. It's here and then it's gone. It's here and then it's gone. Everything is here and then it's gone. All their longings come to nothing because they've considered worthless the God who gave them life and his son who was sent for their salvation. They've scorned these things. So all these strong and powerful people in this life who we tend to fear for their wickedness, they will be pitiful, poor, blind, wretched, weak before the Lord on the day of Christ. They're considered small in his eyes. And it's the Lord who decides the things that are eternal, what things are and what things are not, what things are important and what things are not. He's the one who establishes the pillars in the temple of God and, and writes a new name that will never be forgotten. It's Jesus that gives this picture of the wicked cast into the pits of hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a tragedy. Nobody's forced there, but God desires that all would repent and come to a saving knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. But the reality is that there's people who hate God, they hate Christians, we see it around the world, and they stand on shaky ground, whereas we stand on the rock of ages. When we die, we enter into the presence of the Lord, and we want more and more people to be there. So, praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. A generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. And that is all I have to say today. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you are kind and that you are gracious, Lord, to us. We thank you, Lord, when we count the blessings in our lives, Lord, that you have over, overwhelmed us with your goodness, God. I just pray, Lord, that you know, right now as we're, as we're praying and, and we're going to spend a couple minutes, Lord, uh, in, in worship, Lord, I pray, God, that, that you would speak to us, God, that you would remind us of the good things that you've done in our lives, Lord, that we would just lift up a song of praise and thanks to you, God. Um, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would remember all these goodnesses that you've done to us, Lord, that we would forget not your benefits to us, God. I pray, Lord, that there's those of us here who have uh, been getting bad news or have been getting bad news a lot, Lord, recently. I pray, God, that, that us in those situations, God, would put our trust, our hope in you, God, because you're the one who establishes us, Lord. You're the one who holds us fast, God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would not fear uh, for the future, knowing, God, that you have us as your servants uh, in your hands, Lord, that you will take care of everything that we need, God. Pray for those of us who are, are generous, Lord, who have received just abundance from you, God, that we would just seek your face, Lord, and how to give freely, Lord, how to scatter the gifts to the poor, Lord, uh, how to be generous. As, as you put it on our hearts, Lord, to freely give as you've freely given, God, uh, as you love a cheerful giver, Lord. Uh, and Lord Jesus, we, we just trust in you, God. Um, we, look to, we look to you, God, in all these things, and we praise you for your goodness to us, God. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.